Hallelujah, Father. Praise God. I mean, you feel that. Yeah, that's dunamis. That's dunamis. What's the first thing he created in Genesis? Light. And dunamis was present. And he said, let there be light. The uh, light of heaven fills the atmosphere up. Fills it up with the freedom and liberty. The first thing God ever does is light. Amen. The Lord has enlightened our darkness. Hallelujah. There is no darkness that can stand in light. It chases it away. It chases it all away. Darkness runs from the presence of power and the presence of light. Thank you for the light. Thank you for the dunamis. Thank you for creative dunamis power. Thank you for the atmosphere. It's charging with resurrection life. Amen. So I'm going to have Justin come up. Praise God. Let's give Justin a big hand. <laughs> Woo. I'll tell you, we have the three musketeers tonight. So this is what we'll term them here on out. So we have uh, Justin and Carlos and Andres, and it's going to be powerful. These guys go in the prisons, and they're, they're ministering. And the Lord just said, just have them come and flow. So we are the captives. You guys are here to set us all free by the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, the white suit. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's there. It's, you know, hallelujah. So let's, let's give them a big hand. Hallelujah. I want, to, I want to thank the Father's House, the pastors, uh, Pastor Chuck, Pastor LaRue, Pastor Anna, the leaders, the intercessors, everybody who has faith in us, everybody who prays for us consistently every day as we go into, because it's an honor to be able to go in those walls. A lot of people want to go, but there's a long line, there's a waiting list, and only those that are supposed to go through are in there, amen, and, and to be able to go in there and, and to 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 reach the ones that are that are crawling around, to reach the ones that think that they're unworthy, to reach the ones that we used to be like, because we all used to be like that, uh, especially myself, but the only thing is I never got caught. Amen. I, w I, was able, I was able to run and receive my freedom and then be able to, to go into that place without anything holding me back. All the doors are wide open. I can go into any unit I want to, but we have to have, we have, to have discernment. We have to realize which unit does the Father want us to go into, which unit is ready to hear Hear this message, which unit is ready to receive, which unit is ready to go after they leave those walls to go behind the walls and continue to release. Tim Paul says to Timothy, go and find the faithful ones. And when you find the faithful ones, teach them about love and then send them, send them off. So that's what we're going. We're going to release the captives. We have found the faithful ones. They're growing in the Lord and they're, and they're returning. They're going through in the walls. They're releasing the words. They're coming back with testimonies weekly. The, the word of God, the right hand is being released through out the glory unit, amen. amen. <clears throat> and it's an honor to to be to be used like that. It's an honor to to to, to have the pastors uh, see the character, to see God in us, to see the love flowing from us, to see the faithfulness in us, and and, and to just to pray for us and to commission us and to ordain us and send us out. It's, it's an awesome feeling. Uh, it, it's a it's a desire that's met, amen. And 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 these awesome brothers right here, they stand beside me. They're they're strong brothers in the Lord. They are strong brothers, and and we, and we we continue to talk to each other. We continue to edify each other. We sharpen each other daily. When one's down, whether we got two of them lifting that person up, amen. And, and we're and we're moving strong. We're 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 knocking down walls. We're we're tearing up the bricks, amen. We're we're going in and we're not we're not easing up. And 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 they're strong in the Lord. Amen. Andreas is gonna is gonna start out the night tonight, amen. He's got an awesome word in his heart that he wants to release, and we're all gonna release something to you. We're all gonna release where we are today in the Lord. We're gonna release what's on our hearts, amen. And I just pray that your eyes of understanding are, are, are being enlightened today. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just devour this place in the name of Jesus. I pray that freedom would just release in this place, that 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 he would have every eye captive in here to receive the wisdom of the Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for, for what you're already doing. I thank you for the atmosphere of healing and deliverance. I thank you for the wisdom that's resting upon every heart in here. I thank you for every eye that's being loosed from the world system in the name of Jesus.
Jesus as we speak. I thank you for the love of the, of the Father flowing in this place. The peace that passes all understanding in the name of Jesus. I thank you for this atmosphere. I thank you for this word as it's being released with power and anointing and fire. Being able to baptize as the Lord stands at the gate with the winnowing fork. Separating the shaft and the wheat in the name of Jesus. I thank you for what you're doing already. I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you that are joining us in live stream. Welcome. We just want to say we love you, and we just release love into your office, your home, through live stream. Just release oil from the right hand from Father's house. We welcome you. Christian, if you're watching, my son in Maryland, I love you. We just release healing over you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Anyway, I want to just start off with uh, God is good. All the time. All the time. That's our, our, when we go into the units, that's the first thing they start off with. So we'll try it again. God is good. All the time. And the church said, that's right from the Gore unit. I just want to give a little... <laughs> They're the glory. They, they change it to glory unit. But we release what pastor has instilled in us to those men that are there just looking and they long to see us and they just receive us with open arms. And it's incredible to be, you know, a part of that. Uh, Justin, I thank you for, where do you go? There you are. Okay. Well, first I just want to start real quick by reaching. I just want to give a word to just Billy Graham, you know, today his uh, passing. And just to know that this man led just millions to the Lord and salvation. Millions. His journey through, you know, a true apostle of modern time. It's incredible. And, and it was awesome to see today in CNN and Fox, these, these networks that just constantly are fighting, and they were just edifying the Lord, and oh, now, I'm a, you, know, you know, they were saying their salvation, they were using Jesus and salvation and Jesus for you know, hours. It was awesome, but there was one thing that really caught my attention today was on 9-11, all the planes were grounded that day, as we all know, and the president, George Bush, had contacted Billy Graham and wanted him at the White House. So they chartered a plane. Only one plane was flying that day. One plane flew with a man of God and reached the White House because they wanted Billy Graham to be in the White House that day. Isn't that awesome? Glory to God. Glory to the Father. Amen. Amen. So just real quick, a lot of you may not know a little bit, and those who are visiting on uh, live stream, at 28, I received a, Jesus as my Savior, and like most of us, I was on fire for the Lord, serving. I was privileged to serve under John Osteen, uh, Papa, man, he was incredible. When you first get saved and you sit under John Osteen, it's awesome. You're a baby, you're eating meat. And if you're not ready for meat, he'll send you to the kids' room until you're ready to come back and eat meat. He says, give me a year of your life, and I did. Pastor John Osteen, I know he welcomed Billy Graham today to mighty men of God. After his passing, that's where my journey, my identity, I was looking for meat. You know, and I started looking where, you know, go and find a church that serves this kind of meat. It's hard to find. So pretty much like 25 years went by looking, trying to find a church. Yes. Looking for a church that served me a long time. And I was in a commercial church sitting, waiting. No. Yes. Then one message Carlos gave my sister, is a coworker of Carlos. She gave him a message of Pastor LaRue, and they sent it via uh, phone. And me and my brother, and we listened to it and said, there's me. And this, this pastor's pretty good. And so my sister and I visited, and it was incredible, you know, and we live on the 
far end of town, so the journey over here was it was long. So that was the main thing for me was, well, you know, he's good, but it's it's just too far. <laughs> At the time, I plugged into a YouTube video, and Pastor LaRue was teaching on John 14, and that's where my message is going to start. And I could not stop watching this video, and it was like a month over. And I just had that one message. It was John 14, John 14. And I think when I finally, you know, bit in is when he, when uh, Philip said to him, you know, show us the father. And he said, you know, haven't I been with you long enough? And right there, just like, I got to go. That week at church, the, the church I was attending, the pastor stopped one of the brothers from, we were laying hands and I was a catcher and I was catching him, but he was the only one that he was just filled with the spirit anointing. He was, and I was one catcher, a lot of prayer partners, and they, he got reprimanded by the pastor and told him, you can't do that anymore. So that was my ticket out. So anyway, so that was from, uh, from one message to a video, I was here. And I've been here since, and next month is my one-year anniversary. So I'm sitting over there. And I asked, I said, where do I sign up? You know, where do I, where do I register? And everybody said, we don't register here. So well, what kind of church is this? You know, so for you who have not visited the church, you must come to see what takes place that the camera doesn't show. It's, it's heaven right here in the altar. That's where my, that's where my journey began, my identity. And uh, so we start in John 14. Let, us, let, your, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places, rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That's where, where I am. There you may be. So I'm sitting there, and I'm still wondering, like, I can't imagine how the, you know, disciples were when, when Jesus was saying this to them. I know they didn't talk like this back then, but they probably looked at each other and said, dude, what is he saying? You know, like, you know, where are you going? And, you know, so when I was sitting here and he was releasing this word, I was sort of the same way. I was like, what are you talking about, you know? And then it was like. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I thought that was how we pray to everybody. You know, you pray in Jesus' name, the traditional quotes from all the Bible. I almost wanted to get me a new Bible because I quoted, I highlighted all the famous quotes in the Bible before I found the truth in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. So we go on into uh, my identity journey. And he sends us a helper. You know, not only is he sharing this, and he tells us, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. I'm like, man, this is getting good. You know, he's going to stay with us forever. We're going to carry on. And so I'm, you know, sitting there, didn't know anybody. I have no contact. I didn't know Carlos yet. You know, he, he became, you know, he was my brother back then. He's pastor now. But So when you hear me say, brother Carlos, that was before he was a pastor. Amen. So I'm going through 15, getting to the pruning stage. And I was like, okay, here we go. You know, it's time to get pruned to get growth, you know. And nothing's going to, there's no fruit that's going to take or produce unless I'm pruned and I'm in the vine. And as I'm growing, you know, I'm realizing this as I'm growing. And right about this time, I was introduced to... Um, our lending library. For those of you who are not on it, get on it. If you want growth, if you want to see the Father, what he has for us, it's in the, the lending library. Go in, and so I asked Carlos, and Brother Carlos, still he's still not a pastor yet. So Pastor, oh, Brother Carlos, so he gives me where to go in lending library. So he starts, you know, um, right hand, Throne of Grace, 
golden lampstand, corporate eyewitness, you know, Mount he he uh, Hebron, inheritance. So I'm busy. I'm going through all of this, man. I'm like, I was listening to so much word. This is the truth. I started sounding like Pastor LaRue. <laughs> it was that, it was funny because my wife was going to get in the car one day and I told her, jump in. <laughs> I was like, it wouldn't stop. And then, you know, <laughs> that high pitch was incredible. <laughs> it's true. And the classic little voice when he does when somebody's whining, it was so, that's so classic. I love that. That's probably the best part of your preaching, I like. <laughs> you do that little whiny voice. Amen. That's good. Thank you, Father. So as the pruning stages went through, I find in uh, 9 and 10, as a father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And that's when right hand starts, where the love starts setting in. And I was overwhelmed because he would share with, you know, that we have to go into rest to find the presence. And I didn't know where y'all were going. I was sitting there. I came to Tuesday. It's awesome. Those who haven't been here on Tuesdays, you have to. I was here for like six months laying here and just in rest and learning. I didn't know what I was doing. I was asking Justin. We ended up going, you know, up to Dallas when I finally connected with him. But just learning during 15, the love that the Father had for us. And um, one of the things that really ministered to me in, in 15 was, in 18 and 19, it says, if, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And it's just part of our walk. It's like we're, we're experiencing a lot of the same things he did as we walk. And it goes on to say, if, it were, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, however, because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Then my identity started saying like, well, you know, and then I started remembering Abraham you know, the, the, the swearing of God swore to Abraham, to Jesus, and all of this teaching is taking place, and it's soaking in, and it's soaking in, and I'm excited because I'm in the lending library coming in. I'm on fire, and I wanted to do something more in this church. I mean, every position was taken. So I came into church early, and Pastor Chuck didn't have that many people here, and I said, Father said, start coming to church, and I came to Pastor Chuck, and I said, I'll be your Carlos, like, for <laughs> Pastor LaRue or Tim. You can, you know, shoot, you know, put me down like Pastor LaRue does to my buddy Tim. I said, I'll, I'll fill those shoes in the early service. Yeah, so I said, okay, I'm, I'm at work now. Then Justin comes up here and gives this testimony of prison ministry, and it was awesome. I sit there, and I want to do something. So I came up. I didn't even know Justin. I came up and said, hey, brother, uh, I want to help. Is there any way I can help? And I, <clears throat> I'm thinking he's going to, maybe I could donate some money or pray for him. I don't know if he signed me up before he left. Or next thing I know, he goes, hey, I already enlisted you. And Carlos, y'all need to go get test, you know, to get certified to go into the prison. Next thing I know, it, I'm in the prison. I was like, <laughs> I didn't know. I hear the door slam behind me. Bam. And just these men in white suits, you know, and praise God. I was like, and I don't really, I don't know what's more nerve-wracking is going into prison and preaching to all of these men that, you know, that been arrested or preaching to the father's house. You know, I'm like one year old, man. All these <laughs> senior people here. It's like, be patient with me. Amen. Amen. And as I started growing, it was, you know, my plate's full now. And in 40, <laughs> I was, uh, went and had myself checked it for, uh, like, I think it was ADHD. And then I started, you know, I know I'm going to get set free from it, but I had to deal with it at that time. That's why I have so many notes. And if I would have forgotten, I was just going to start reading the Constitution because I didn't even know what to do. I was just going to start reading out of this book. So this is a good backup. Thank you pastor. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. 
Hallelujah. And as my heart, the eye of my heart started to grow through this, it started to grow and it just started just filling me up with this love of the right hand of God, which, I mean, I felt, I was telling just, I felt like I was born again. You know, I felt like I could breathe and I, I felt like it was refreshing. It was like being born again. You know, when you, when you have this position, it, it feels that way to me. It, I was excited when I first was saved. But when you enter into the right hand, and I encourage you, you know, seek it, seek it, go into the library, find your identity. And as we got into 16, as I said, my, the, my eye of my heart started to grow, and I could see things now in the spirit where I was always looking for my identity in a mirror. Because I remember the first time I looked in a mirror, and when I looked back, it said, saved. And I thought that was my identity. I thought that was my identity. I said, oh, he's saved. And, you know, and I'd go back and look, and it was faith. It's okay, I have faith. And I would look at that, and I said, okay, that's my identity. And as I grew, I started to see my identity. And in 16, as I'm going through 14, 15, this is see how much time I got to go quick. Because when we're in, in the prison, <laughs> we, we're passing the mic like, like the baton on, you know, what is it when they run the race, the relay races, yeah. And what's so awesome, these men, when you're behind a six-year and a two-year, they're waiting for that baton, like, come on, give it to me. It is. It's awesome. It's like you got to put stick them on the microphone so you won't get rid of it. So in, in 16, 13, it says, however, this is one of the moments that really another that it's just all the moments. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you to come. And pastor had told me, in my Bible says, he will tell you things to come, and we scratched that, that part out. And then I started knowing <laughs> to come. Well, because, the, the, you know, it's not things to come, he's to enter in. I was, and then it was following in, and it was, it was awesome. Sorry, Pastor. <laughs> he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Yes, amen. And it's so good to see Pastor laughing. It's awesome. And I'm going to close with this. I don't know how Jesus prayed. In, 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 in 17, they say that he's coming in and the last prayer before he goes, goes to the cross and it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven. And I don't know whether he kneels or stands or how, I can't even imagine. But for him to pray and to lift his head up, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. And it's always through this book that he puts Father first and then him. Those you have sent me, Father God. It's through this. And the eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And, and as I read this part, I'm thinking like he's either on his knees with his hands up, I'm imagining him praying. And he said that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. And this, I'm receiving this, and I'm like, oh, he's praying this to the Father for me. I am in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. It's the same love of the Father gave Jesus is on me. And then when he came in and said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, again, may be with me. That's awesome. Be with me. That's awesome. Where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundations of the world. I was there also. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, 
but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me again. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. And he told me to look at your identity now, son. And as I looked into the mirror, I learned that my identity was in his word. And I just would see it. And it's in my identity. It's in the word. And I just want to thank you. God bless you guys. Love you. We do, we do get shook down a lot, amen? <laughs> it, it's just funny, and since this is a humorous service, let me share something real quick. I went last week to go to, to, the, to, the, to the men's place to get some dress shirts and a bow tie for the, for the Valentine thing here. And, and so the guy walked up to me after I got my bow tie. He walked up to me to measure because while I was there, I was going to get a few more shirts. And, and so he was going to get a custom shirt because they didn't have the color that I wanted. So he went ahead and measured me. And when he walked up to me, he, he grabbed that ruler out and he walked up to me and patted me on the shoulders. And he went to go around my neck while I did like this, you know. <laughs> and and so, so I'm stretched out like this and he's looking at me. He's not saying nothing. And so he's getting through. He, he's like giving me that eye and he, he's like, He's like, okay. He says, now turn around. And I was like, okay. And I, and I turned around, and he patted me on the shoulders again, and I, and I did like this. <laughs> and he goes, no, sir, I need you to put your arms down. I need to, I need to take you. And so he did like that, and he started measuring me, and I, and I went back out. <laughs> and I finally realized what I was doing at the moment, and I told him, sorry, I just got out of prison. <laughs> I said, I said, no, really, really. I go to prison a lot. <laughs> but not, not one laugh, not one smile from him. But that's okay. But while, while, I was paying, while I was paying for the shirts, I told him, I said, no, I'm a minister. I go into the prisons a lot, and we get shut down. I'm sorry if, I, if, if, if there was a little bit of uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, Father. Uh, it was good, though. It was good. <laughs> the, the state of perfection, when we, when we come into the Father and we learn to abide in the Father and we, and we learn to come into the rest, and, and, and that's when we, we go to, we find our identity in Him. It's an awesome place because I've yearned, I've, I've come on 10 years of my salvation, 10 years sober, 10 years seeking the Father, and, and, and just, just laying on my face and, and just trying to receive everything I can. Father, I just want to feel your presence. Father, I just, I just want you to hold me in my arms. And I used to tell people the best prayer. I used to, I went, when I felt the presence of God leave and I would call my spiritual father at the time, I had the best, I had the best time in prayer this morning. He said, he said, wow, what, what did he tell you? I said, he touched me. And, and, but it was, it was just that touch. He didn't have to say nothing. It was, it was just that touch of the Father, and, and that's what continued to fill me with the compassion. That continued to fill me with the, keep going, Justin. Keep going. I, 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 I love what you're doing, your labor of love. I love, because whenever he saved me, whenever he pulled me from, from the pits of hell, uh, from, from running around and selling the dope and chasing after the women and, and drinking and, and, and just hating life, I was enjoying being miserable because that's all that I knew that's all that was in my atmosphere that's all that I was surrounded by but I, I did not know how to to feel the father's presence or to just to feel that presence on purpose and and, and today I, I know how because the father heard my cry like David said you know, men, men in the prison are crying. Women, you can see them crying. You, you, women, you can see when they have an issue, when they have a problem, when they come home because they talk about it and it, and it comes out of their mouth and you can, you can see their problem and you can hear their problem. Men, we keep it in. When we have a problem, we have something that we can't figure out, we go to the darkest place or the quietest place and we sit there and we sit there and we sit there and we ponder and we ponder and ponder. And some men in the prisons never came out of that state. 
8. And, and, but David said, Father, you heard my cry. You're the only one that heard my cry. But see, Father heard my cry because he knew that I yearned to be in the presence. He knew that I yearned. I want to I, I run my race with everything. He knew, he knew what was in my heart. He knew where he was going to send me. He knew where I had to go. But it was maybe, maybe that dryness, maybe because it took so long to come here to, to have such a faithful pastor, apostle before you that can teach you through the word and not through worship how to sit in his presence on purpose and learn who you are and really receive from him and not go to somebody else and say, can I get a word because I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I have a problem. I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. Can you give me a word and run off a man's word instead of God's word? And so, and so here I am today, and, 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 but we can, we can take that for granted, though. We really can, because, because for two years, I, 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 can, I sit in, well, for about a year and a half, because about six months was just laboring in and, and knocking down the walls and, and all the emotions and the fear and, and the doubt and, and trying to get these words in me and trying to keep them and trying to, and just, just day after day and learning a new system, learning a new way of prayer, learning a new way of spending time with the Father, learning, learning the way that will get you into that place, just developing a compass on the inside of me that will take me to a place that I yearn to be for so long it, it was it was awesome and then when you get there but 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 sometimes when you go when you go when you go and you get his touch and you get his touch and you get his touch and he showers you with love and you walk out with peace and, and just day after day after day it can become you can just be content with that and it can just be like a daily ritual but we have to grow. The Father sent me today to tell you we have to grow. It's time to step up because He wants to crown the church. He says, don't be content. He says, step into His love. Go deeper. Don't be content. We have to go. We have to, we have, to have understanding of the love of the Father before we can walk in the love of the Father. And so, and so when, when in, in, in Proverbs 4, 7, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. He says, get wisdom. He says, but in all you getting, He says, get understanding. We have to have understanding. Wisdom is the, the application of knowledge. If, we, don't, if we, we can have wisdom, we can have wisdom, but if we don't have understanding of that which we're trying to release or that which we're trying to receive, then we don't have the knowledge. We don't receive the revelation knowledge. We don't have the understanding. We can't apply it appropriately. So we have to. And, and the love, love is very difficult because love is just thrown around like a, like a rag these days. It really is by the world. And, and it, it's, it's bad. Romans 13, 8 says that, that owe no man anything but to love one another. He says, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. We understand that that's the greatest commandment. We understand that we have to love. But what is love? What does it mean to love? Because I know what it means to rest now because I conquered that place. And through a trial last year when, when I was tested by that place that, that, I, that I held very boldly and confidently, I was tested and for the first time in 25 years I was laid off on a job. And then, and then I got kicked out of a house that I was paying on rent every month early for six years. Years. And then I was like, what's going on? And it's, but I was being tested. See, we're, we're not going to be tested by the flesh. We're tested by the word that we receive that, that has been engrafted in our hearts. And that has changed us. But before we can go into the next level, we have to be tested by that word. I understand that the Lord stands at the, at the, at the, at the, at the throne of grace with a winnowing fork. And we can go in there and, and he can take out. That way we don't have to go through the trials and the tribulations. But, but once we conquer that resting place, of, once we allow the Lord to conquer that resting place, of need on the inside of us, well, here comes a test. Let me see. Just, just like in the book of Philemon, when, when Paul writes a letter to, to, to Philemon, and he says, because Philemon was a slave owner, and he had a slave, and his name was Onesimus. Well, Onesimus got caught up, and he ran. But see, back in the days, whenever you owed a lot of money, you wrote down everything that you owed, and you put it on a piece of paper, and you nailed it to the doorpost. And when the rich man walked by, and he seen, he seen what you owed, if he decided he wanted to pay off your debt and take you into slave, take you over there into captive, and, and, to, and so that you can become a slave, he done that. And see, Philemon took Onesimus as a slave. He says, I'm going to pay your debt. Come and follow me. But Philemon was a spiritual son of Paul. He was a godly man. It was the thing to do back then. You paid off a debt. You come work for me. You work it off. I know you can't afford. I know you can't pay it off, but come work for me. 
And so, so, so one Siemens got caught up and he took off running. And, and, and he probably took something from Philemon, but he got caught and he ended up in prison and ran into Paul. And, and, and Paul and his ministry turned Philemon, in, I mean, turned one Siemens inside out and, and showed him his identity and showed him who he was. And then he says, okay, I'm going to test my spiritual son on love because he's sitting there t- teaching the church of Ephesus about love. And he's teaching them, and he writes them a letter, and he says, he says, I wish I can command you. He says, I want to command you to receive my son. He says, but instead of commanding you, I want to, I want to test you. I want to see, because I see, because everything that I'm seeing from the saints at Ephesus is, is bringing joy to my heart. Because everybody is being refreshed by your love. And, and I can see that. He says, but, he says, I'm, here comes a test. And, and he edifies them and he lifts them up from the love that he sings inside of them. But he says, but see, your old slave, he ran into me and in my ministry. And in my old age, see, Paul is not the, this is not the shipwrecked Paul. This is not the Paul that got bitten by a snake. This is old man Paul. This man has been walked and he has done and he's been persecuted and he has went through and he has done and he's, and he's coming to the end of his days. And he says he's coming from a heart of love because he tells Timothy uh, to go to Ephesus when he's going to Macedonia. And he says, please, please, son, go to, go to, go to Ephesus. He says, I taught him love. I, I, I built him from the foundation of love. And, and I tried to build him up. And, and, and they was doing good. And, and some people creeped in on him and started teaching the law and started doing this. And, and, so, and, and so now they're running off track. And he says, I know you're faithful. I, I know you know that I want people to, to operate from a pure and conscious heart that, that, that wants to come from love. And see, so, so he, he taught Timothy that. And he taught Philemon that but he says Philemon he says he says he says I want to see what you have inside of your heart this man that that was once your slave owner he says he says I'm going to send him back for he's I'm going to send him back to you he says he says he used to not be useful to you he says, but now he is very useful. He says, I, I thought about keeping him myself because he is an awesome man of God but he's going to do you some good and, and he says, he says, I know you're going to do it, and I know that you're even going to do more than that. He says, but you've got to pass this test if you want to be elevated. And, and, so, and so he says, see, he had to leave for a season. And sometimes we have to leave for a season like I did. I had to, I had to leave the people in my past. I had to leave the people that wasn't, that wasn't taking me where I wanted to go because they couldn't get me there. They didn't know how. They wanted to go to the same place, but the door was closed. And for a season, I had to, I had to run away like one Seamus as a, as a runaway slave and take off running. And the Lord heard my cry, and I, and I took off, and the Lord led me to the Father's house. And now there's a compass set in my heart. And see, I was once a slave, and I was once a, a dope dealer, and I was, I was once running around with no identity. But, but now the Father, like, like Paul has shown one Seamus his identity, the Father has shown me my identity. Amen? And, and so, and so whenever, whenever, whenever Philemon had received one Seamus, they got elevated. They got elevated. The, uh, Philemon was a pastor, and he turned into an apostle. And, and one Seamus was a, a man running from, in slavery, and, and he found his identity. And, and now he went on to be the pastor at the church of Ephesus. Awesome. It's, it's awesome once you, once you learn your identity and you, and you learn your purpose. And that's what God showed Adam when he was in the Adam. I mean, when he was in the Garden of Eden. He says, I want you to work, but not work, work. Work is to become yourself. I want, I want you to find your identity. I want you to become yourself. I want, to, I want you to walk into who you are, who I've created you to be. He was speaking destiny. He was speaking life into him. He said, I want you to cultivate. He said, I want you to, to know your purpose. I want, to, I want you to know your vision. I want you to dream with me. I want you to see where you're going. And once you see where you're going, then I'm going to send you a helpmate. Because you have to have your vision. You have to, because, because, a, because a house divided. A house divided will not stand. If a man does not know his, his vision, if the man does not know his identity and he tries to find a woman, then there's two visions. It's, gonna, it's not going to stand. It's not going to stand. A man has to know where he's going. And when I met my wife, I was running full force in the prison. I knew what I was doing. I knew where I was going. And the Lord sent her to me, and she came beside me, and we're going full force. And, and, and it's awesome.
In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. We have to understand. He says, My knowledge is out there, and I reject you because you reject it. He says, A lot of the problems you're having, a lot of the battles that you're facing, a lot of things that you can't get through is on a book on the shelf at your house. You have to read. You, you have to, or it's in the presence of the Father. If you would come and sit down with me, you would receive because love passeth knowledge. And if you would sit in my presence, you would receive the word that you need to get through this door. And so, see, whenever I lost my job and everything, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I allowed him to overcome that resting place of need, and, and, and it, it didn't move me. And I said, Father, you, you're in control. And, and I had perfect peace through these two months of trying to find the house. And the Lord blessed me. And, and when he blessed me, he overshowered me. And that's when I learned because when Pastor was telling me, you have to get in the Father's love. You have to get in the Father's love. You have to go. You have to go. And I'm like, what does it feel like? He says it feels good. What does love feel like? I don't know what love. I mean, I want to feel. Well, uh, then I get in the spirit. Was that love? I don't know, huh? Was, uh, I mean, I, mean, what, I, I, was, I was trying to. But see, but see, whenever, whenever I was going through that trial, when I was going through that test of the resting place, and, 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 I, and, I, and, and, I, and I approved, and I, when I passed the test, and he brought me into the blessing, and, and then, he, then he brought the church, and he brought the, the brothers and the sisters, and they came and showered me and my wife with blessings, the, and just filled my whole house with free furniture, and, and just, just blessing after blessing, and I, and I seen the unconditional love, and, and I seen the loving kindness of the Father, and that's when he opened a door in, in January, uh, uh, Jeremiah 31.3, and he says, I love you with an eternal love, and I shower, and, and I draw you with loving kindness and so I said that's what love is whenever you sit in a position that you are called to sit in as a king and as a priest and no matter what storm no matter what trial no matter what temptation comes to you if you can stand there and say I know who I am I know who my daddy is this shall too shall pass and, and you and you wait it out and you get through this and you have in you the peace that will calm the storm and you can speak to that storm and say, be still. There's a blessing coming. And you can get through there. And I got elevated at that moment after I passed that test and all the blessings came. That I got elevated. And then in January, I went on a fast. Not to get more elevated, but to learn this. The, uh, not, not, I just wanted to learn more discipline. I, I just wanted to be with him more. And, and I fast a lot of time just to, just to learn how to say no and how to say no. Because a lot of times we say yes too much and we get caught up in busyness. And when we get run, we, t we get taken away from the place that we need to abide in. Amen. Amen. And we get caught up in works and we get caught up in everything else and we lose our relationship. Revelations 2.5 says, You have fallen from a high place. Repent back to your place of love, your first love. And see, how can you, how can you not know that you have fallen from a high place? Because if you continue to get lost in works, if you continue to get lost in doing and doing and doing and doing, then slowly but slowly but slowly you come away from that place and you're like, wow, where did it go? But you can fall from such of a high place in the mountain and hit the bottom and not even know it until somebody finally tells you. And I was like, wow, that is awesome. And, and so we have to learn what do we value most. We have to learn that if you look at marriage, it said marriage in Hebrews 13, 4. If you look at marriage as husband and wife, and you look at marriage as Jesus and our relationship with him. He says, he says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Marriage is honorable. Honorable is valuable. It's, it, it means it's costly. You, you, you hold it highly esteemed. Uh, we just throw marriage around like we throw our relationship with God. Well, not this church, but I mean, I mean, other churches. You know, they 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 throw it around like like when they don't feel like praying that morning, they just go to work anyways. And, and when they come home, they they might go to the gym instead of going to the prayer closet because that place is more important. But we want to make the outside look better. But see, he don't even test the flesh; he tests the inner man, and then our inner man gets entangled with the world's system. System. And, it, and it's just crazy. But we have to value. We have to value. What do we value? We go to job. We go to our work every day. We don't miss work because we want to eat. We don't miss work 
because we want new clothes. We don't miss work because we value work. But see, when we have a bad relationship at work, just like we have a bad, sometimes whenever there's, a, there's an argument stirs up at our house with our husband or with our wife, a lot of times we just want to throw in the rag and, and take off running. But at work, we just we continue to go to work and we deal with that problem. And, and, and a week or two weeks later, we get through it. But see, we don't go to work because of that person that we get into an argument with. We go to work because of the boss of the owner of the institution of the company. Amen. And so we have to honor the word marriage, that covenant, that relationship that we have with the Lord. And it doesn't matter what we go through, whatever bickering we're doing with one another, we still have to push and we still have to fight. Amen. We have to push through. We have to be strong. We have to take it by force. Amen. Marriage. Marriage, the Hebrew word for marriage is a gem. It's a, it's a diamond. It's a, it's a, it's a ruby. You, you know, when you find stuff like that, you don't find it just on top of the surface getting thrown around. It's, it's way down there. And by all the pressures and the heats and the frictions and, and everything and, and different mixtures of things coming together and the pressures and the heat and, the, and, and, and it turns into a gem. Not five years, not ten years, sometimes a hundred years. Sometimes we never reach that place that we desire to reach, but as long as we try, as long as we push, that's all that matters. So, so just as we go to work every day, even though we might have an issue, and, and, and we get through that issue, and now we have a better day, we have to get through whatever issues we're having at home. And we have to push through with love. Love is a force from the inside. Love is fuel to go. See, love is not going to keep you married. Love is not the foundation of marriage. Because I still love my ex-wife, but I'm not, I'm not married to her. Love is, is not going to keep us together. We have to understand what love is. I love her, but we have two separate visions. We're not going in the same direction. She chose to go one way. I, I chose to keep going. And, and I honor God. And I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to move. I'm going where you want me to go. And she chose to walk away. I still love her. We're not together. Love will push death away. When my grandma was dying, she waited and she waited and she was on that machine and she could have, she could have just let go at any moment. But when you're, when you're fighting a disease and you're fighting death, love has the power to push that away until all your grandchildren get into the room. To where, to where all your kids and all your grandchildren are in there. To, to, to where when there's peace, sometimes whenever people are beside the bed of somebody that's fixing to get be released to the Father, there's a lot of bickering and fighting and because they don't know how to deal with the situation. But see, love will wait until, until there's total peace. Until the last grandson gets in the room. And when, there's that, when that last grandson gets in there, and there's that still, that stillness, and that peace, the love will let go. See, we got to have love fights. Love has no reason. I don't love my wife because she has a Coke bottle figure. I don't, I don't hold her to that expectation. And she doesn't love me because, because I make six figures. Because, because I'm expected to keep that job, and if I lose that job, then what, she don't love me no more? If she has three or four babies and she loses that figure, then all that pressure that's upon her. Nowadays, you see, I see women three, four o'clock in the morning running and jogging and, or, or in the evening time running and going to the gym. And, and it's okay if they want to do it for themselves. But a lot of times it's that man point, pointing at It's that man sitting at the house with a fat belly watching TV. And telling you, telling you, you get out there. If, you, if love has a, has a reason, you just cancel love out. Love is caring. When a father is fixing to give his daughter away to, to, the, to the man of her dreams, he done cultivated her, he done protected her, he done raised her up, he done loved her like a father was supposed to love her. She knows what love is now. And see, see, and, and when a man comes into the, to that man and say, hey, I want to I care for your daughter. I want to marry her. See, like Jesus in John 14, too, like my brother read, he said, Jesus, he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. But when I come back, then I'm going to receive you in myself, and then we're going to go. See, see, love says I have everything planned out. Love, love, tells, love tells the bride's father, thank you for bringing her to the position that she is now. 
This is what I have. I have her a two-story house. I have, I have her her own car already. I have a, a maid that's, gonna, that's cleaning the house right now. I, I have, a, I have a three closets for her, and they're all filled with clothes. Love says, I care for her so much, it's already, her needs are already met. Love says, I watch. Love says, love says, I love her so much, I'm going to take care of her, and I'm going to study her, and, and I'm going to give her what she needs before she asks for it. Because the Father says, before you even ask, you already have. Love is a decision to meet the other's need for the rest of their life. With no expectations. I'll close with this. First Kings 3. It's a story. See, when you have understanding with love and you have understanding of revelation, knowledge of what love is, and then you want to be like Solomon and you want to operate in wisdom. In First Kings, these two women came to King Solomon and said, we have a little situation. Us two prostitutes live in the same house I had a baby she had a baby three days later we went to bed one night I rolled over on top of my baby and it died but I woke up and went and stole the other woman's baby and pulled her into my bed and gave her the dead baby and but whenever the woman with a dead baby woke up and she tried to nurse it, and it wouldn't take, and she realized, this is not my child. And they ran to Solomon to get, try to get this figured out. And, and Solomon knowing the love, Solomon knowing what love is, Solomon having wisdom because he's been seeking, he's asking for wisdom and asking for understanding in order to judge the good from the bad. And so, so when he says, he, he told his servant, he says, go get me a sword. See, sometimes love has to lose because when a servant came back with the sword, he says, okay, we're going we're gonna to split this living baby in half, and I'm going to give you half, and I'm going to give you half. And the one that that baby belonged to, she says, no, let it live. I'm not going to fight with this no more. Do not cut that baby in half. Just, just, just give the child to her. And the woman that was going to receive the child, she says, no, cut it in half. Solomon knew exactly where that baby belonged. Because if you, if you bore, if you labored and you have something that you labored for, you are not going to let it go. You have the compassion for it. And no matter if you have to lose in order for that to keep going, you're going to do it. Amen? And a lot of people in a lot of situations envy and there's a lot of jealousy because of, because of ministries and, and people exceeding and people growing and, and their ministries taking off and their awesome marriage. But, but they don't see the sacrifice, the labor of love behind the closed doors. Because in my last, in my, in my last marriage, you know, y'all don't know that I had Bibles thrown at me. Y'all don't know that I had to duct tape my Bibles. Y'all don't know that, that the knife was coming after me. You don't know that I had to pry the fingers off the pistol because she was fixing to pull the trigger. You don't know that she was fixing to run the truck off the creek while I was in it. You don't know that I was hiding under the underpass after I took off running from my house and she ripped my shirt off and I was hiding in the top and, and, I, and she was driving my truck around the, the, the street right there looking for I know you're around here. And I had to go home that night to that. But I did because I honored marriage and I'm not going to give up and I'm going to push through. You don't, you don't know that I, that, I, that I lay in my bed every night or, or lay in the prayer room every night and, 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 just, and just wait there in the silence in the presence of God just, just listening to the guys in the prisons cry, Lord, let me hear their cry. Lord, give me the compassion. Lord, give me the love. Let me, let me take to them. Let me receive what it is that they need. Give me a word for them, Lord. You don't, you don't see the, the years and the years of uh, why some people are watching Super Bowl, some people are studying while some people are sleeping at seven or eight o'clock or 11 or 12 o'clock on Saturday some people are up at three o'clock in the morning sitting in the presence and studying and, and and breaking down the doors and interceding 
I mean, where's your value? Do you, do you value this church? Do you value this, this, this pastor that's been seeking the Lord for 30 or 40 or 50 years and, and, and how much he's been on his face? How many hours uh, a day or a month or every six months or how many hours a year do you pray for these pastors? Where, where's your value at? Do you come here every Sunday just to receive? Do you not give back? Where's your labor of love at? What are you, what are you giving back? What are you putting in? Well, because, because expectation, if you want to succeed in life, there's going to be a sacrifice. And the level of sacrifice determines the level of success. We have to push through. And the Father wants to put a crown on us. And we're fixing to take off running. But He wants a pure, He wants a conscience heart. He wants us to know what love is. So, so when like Philemon, whenever, whenever the slave took him for everything that he had, when one seamus gets to Philemon, he can love him with a pure heart and receive him. And they can walk together in ministry. I mean, we have to get to that point where we can, we can bear all things. Amen. Yes, and that, that was the, uh, the Justin that I saw like months after months sitting here, and then when I went to prison with him, who's this man? <laughs> who's this man? But yeah, and it's awesome. First, uh, so Father, we come to you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Father. Jesus. We eat of you, Lord. We eat of your flesh, Father. We drink of your blood. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you that we have sweet communion with you, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we can approach you through your word. We can know you through your word. And, Father, we thank you that you've given the church a voice, Lord. Media has a voice, Lord. Celebrities have a platform for a voice, Lord. But your, your body, Lord, you're bringing your voice through your body, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for what you're doing in this body. And we just, we glorify your name, Father. And we just thank you for your word. Let it go forth, Lord, to fall in good soil. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So, yeah, it's, uh, wow, to come after that. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the word of God is so awesome. And one of the things that I was going to say is that <clears throat> when, when the Lord came into the earth, the Lord Jesus, he came through the virgin birth and he walked this earth. If you read through the scriptures, there were times where, most times, when he would approach, whether it was a group of people or whether it was the disciples, most of the time he would say, fear not. Fear not. When he went and cast out the legions, those demons out of that man that was demon possessed, they had him leave. They were like, just go ahead and leave. Leave from here. And as a baby Christian, when I was reading those scriptures, I was like, why would they want him to leave? Like, man, I want him to stay, but they wanted to leave. And as he continued walking, like, he would always say, fear not. And we're going to go to the scriptures in John chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 53. And before I go into it a little, I'll set a little bit of the, back, of the backdrop. So this is when he actually had had fed the multitudes, and then there's, there's a whole bunch of people following him. And when they approach him, we're going to get, we're gonna get to uh, John chapter 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, except you eat of my flesh, eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, I live by the Father. So he that eats me, eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat the manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear this? Who can hear it? Then Jesus, 
When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said to them, Does this offend you? What if I should say that the Son of Man will ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickens, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And I want to stop there. And, you know, imagine if he was walking with you here on the earth right now, and you hear, you got to eat my flesh. You got to eat of my, my blood, drink of my blood. That's a pretty, pretty hard thing. And, you know, with us, as we're going to continue to walk with God, that was one of the things that, you know, when we approach the scriptures, it's kind of we gloss over. It's like, well, eat of my flesh. and drink. But what he was saying, he wasn't, I mean, God is not carnivore and he's not obviously a vampire, but he's saying eat of my drink, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. But what he was saying is, you need my you need my living word man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of god you need my word you need to live off my word and then drinking of my blood speaking of communion with him and there's it's double layered because it was speaking of he was going to offer his body as a sacrifice and his blood was going to be shed and he but he's saying that we need we need his word daily we need his word we need to be one with his word, and we also need communion. And that's what he was speaking of. He wasn't saying, come and eat my flesh. He was, he was you know, he always spoke <laughs> at a way higher level. He was speaking about spiritual things. He was saying, my word is life. It's spirit and it's life. So with that said, as Pastor has been teaching us, uh, it's, it's going to be short and sweet, but as Pastor has been teaching us about the Father's love, how much closer does God want us to be with him? Pastor has taught us how, you know, the scripture teaches how even in the Old Testament when, when, they were, uh, when they were given the pattern of the tabernacle, God wanted to be with us. When man fell, he wanted to be close to us, and he had to build a system where he could approach us and how we could have relationship with him. But all that was a substitute until Jesus came to die on the cross. After he came on the cross... Even before he went to the cross, when he was telling his disciples in the upper room, he said, he said that he's going to send the spirit of truth. He'll be with you, or, or he's with you, and he'll be in you. So at that time, they weren't even born again yet, but he was saying, once you're born again, he's going to be in you, the spirit of truth. So now, after we receive God, as you know, we, we get saved, whether we knew how it took place or not, the bottom line is, when we get saved, once we begin relationship with God, how much closer do we have a relationship with God that he's given himself to us? He came, died on the cross, and then not only that, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and now he says, where he is, there we shall be also. When we're born again, whether we know it or not, we're one with him. He has he's already paid the price, and he's, he's reconciled our lives unto our God. And now, how much closer can you be to God than him being on the inside of you? You are one with God. Just the way you're one with him here, you're one with him there. That's, that's the key is, you know, a lot of us can understand when God visits us, when we feel his presence. When it, but just the way he's one with you, most people, I, I asked in the prison, I told them, are you guys, how many of you guys know you're born again? And most of them raised their hand. And I said, how many of y'all know that God's in you? Because the scripture says that, that the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we're sons of God. You just have an inner knowing that you're born again, that, that God's in you, that you're one with God. And, I was, and most of them lifted their hand. And I said, well, just the way you know he's in you, that he's with you, that you're one with God. I said, in the same way, you're one with him there. And it seems so far away, but the kingdom of heaven is within like we're one, we can't get any closer to God than what he's already done. So what the scriptures do is it builds the image so that our faith can step into what he already did. It's already, it's a purchase redemption. It's already all there. It's, it's full. Pastor has taught us the pathway and, and he said it in his messages, set the compass, launch them off, set the compass, launch them off. And that's what we're doing. When we go to the prisons, all we're doing is just telling them what the word says here, and they're entering into identity. When, when, I was, when I told them one of the first times, because when you listen to them worship as the service begin, 
you would hear some of them say sinners saved by grace and and they had they had they esteemed Christ so high Jesus Jesus they do lift up Jesus but them they're way down here I'm just a little and and maybe they might even have strongholds or whatever and they they just feel shameful but Jesus is way lifted up but when you tell them that you're holy it, I mean you could see their countenance was like and and because God was anointing the word as I was speaking it and I was like the scripture calls you holy you're a saint. When you're born again, when you became one with God, you became a vessel that can contain a holy God. I said, you're now a holy vessel. You're now holy to God. You're separated from this world system. I said, whether you know it or not, you're holy. In God's sight, if you have Christ in you, you're holy. And, and it was just such a receiving that that's why they're so grateful at the end of the service. They come, all they're doing is getting enlightened on what it says in here. And, and they're stepping in, and we're seeing the fruit of it. So with us, how much more that pastor has taught us the right hand, the right hand. Now we understand that the right hand, it's everything. Jesus, he gave us everything. He gave us not just salvation. One day we die, we go to heaven. Nope. <laughs> That's so shallow of what he did. He died, but he gave us resurrection life, and he gave us everything he has with the father everything from the love that he has with the father to him being the one that received the seven inheritance he's he he gives it freely to us he said if he if he gave us his son how shall he freely not give us all things he gave us we have everything that jesus owns and we have the entire relationship intact the way jesus has the relationship with the father he gave it to us so it's now up to us to step into it and not be afraid of the deep things of God. Because imagine if Jesus walked the earth. I mean, what, what are you going to get to be afraid of him? He's, and he didn't sugarcoat words. I mean, imagine for him to be saying, if you don't eat of my flesh, if you don't drink of my blood, you can't be my disciple. You can't. <laughs> so, and, and that's the beautiful thing. Like seeing Andres up here, seeing uh, Justin it's so awesome to see the fruit of my pastor's labor. And right now I declare not just 500 disciples, but 500 times 500. We declare it, Lord. We release it, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we're just, we're just a, a, a forerunner, Lord, and, and equippers of the ones that you're going to bring, Lord. And, and we thank you for our pastor, Lord. We thank you for the, the dual oil, Father, that's flowing, Father, from the two olive trees. And it's filling our lampstand, Father. We walk in full light. We walk in the, uh, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth. We can, we can partake of your omnipresence, of your omniscience, Father, so that we can uh, just walk in light, walk in truth, be representatives of you, Lord, so that you can walk amongst the golden lampstands, Lord, and, and, and just see your body, Lord, to see yourself in us, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for everything you've done in this body. We thank you for our pastor, Lord, that it would be multiplied, Lord, with the authority that's granted to your word, Lord. We multiply his life, Father, that it would be multiplied and blessings, Father, multiplied in his life. And we thank you, Lord, that we will be like the ones that lifted Moses' hands, Father. We'll help him, Lord. We'll lift his hands, and Father, it's such a, pr a privilege to walk in your truth, Lord. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. And we also release your power, Lord. We release your power, Father, for the captives to be set free, for the yokes to be broken. We thank you, Father, that where, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So, Father, we thank you, Father, for all of us stepping into our callings. We thank you, Father. We activate the callings. We release destiny, Father. Release resurrection life, Father. We release grace to empower those destinies, Father. And we just thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives, Lord. We seal these words. In the mighty and the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Woo! Come on. Let's give God glory. Wow. Man, I can't tell you all the different things flowing through me right now. I mean, Chuck and I have waited on a 20 years for this i mean i always knew in my spirit there would be a team of 
apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists. And in the early days, I was so ambitious to make that happen. I would just promote anything and everything. And I didn't know. And it bit us over and over and over again. And then we would wait and it bite us again. But now you can see the true DNA. God started teaching us how to preserve the DNA of the house and how to recognize agenda-driven operations and the true operations. And you can see just the way these three musketeers ministered tonight. They're all unique in their personalities, but they all carry the DNA and they carry honor. And I just want to thank all three of you. That was just awesome. Wow. Amazing. Truly my heart's like, uh, I'm just overwhelmed just listening. You're so funny. Uh, 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 oh, my God. How long have you been here? I was so funny when he said, you know, after John Osteen, I went to go, and then 25 years later, you know. <laughs> and then one year of being here, all of a sudden, you're ministering in the DNA one year, and that should speak to all of you right now. If you, if you come up right and you develop the right relationships and you engraft in, it doesn't take very long to find your place. Amen? To find your identity.